people in the room been enjoying the hallway track? Good. All right. So, uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, as, uh, I don't actually consider myself a security expert. I consider myself a uh, amateur who is like deeply fascinated and really into thinking about it. Uh, you know, though I do work in IT. Uh, but maybe that's kind of like saying if you're a um, a ham ra amateur radio operator, a ham, that they're not an expert in how radio works, right? So. Uh, and I was kind of saying something along these lines as were all the things uh, two years ago. And uh, I just want to make a quick correction. So two years ago I was saying, hey, we could split up uh, Bitcoin private keys by using Zor, just like RAID 5. And Alex Weber points out to me, okay, well, it's a 256-bit key, and the way you're thinking about it is that everyone gets a third of that and has to search uh, the rest. But as Alex pointed out to me, really the effective key space in ECDSA is half of that. So you're really actually giving everyone uh, that much of the key in effect, and uh, each party in that scheme I presented two years ago actually only has to search 86 bits, which is still a lot, uh, but it's um, you know not as much as I thought. And the thing is, completely unnecessary. As Alex pointed out to me, there is a much more standardized way to do secret sharing. So there's Shamir uh, secret sharing with the math to make your head hurt. Um, and it turns out the uh, the Bitcoin world has an even better solution for what I was showing, uh, and it's kind of well established now. Uh, they call it multi-signature. The idea being, uh, you ha let's say you ha you're doing a two of three scheme, two out of three people have to sign. Well, that's just like a business check where it's two out of three signatures. And this is actually better than Shamir's secret sharing for Bitcoin because you actually are generating the keys on each person's individual machine. You're not actually having it the, uh, everything exist in one place at a single time. All right, so that's the correction from two years ago. Let's talk about uh, what I'm here for today. So um, we want to authenticate the boot process. Why is the boot process important? Let's use full disk encryption as, a, as an example of one that we care about. So full disk encryption is a misnomer. You don't have the full disk encrypted because your CPU can't read your mind as to what the decryption keys are. So you have to have not encrypted at the front of the drive uh, bootstrap software that will do the process of saying, hey, uh, give me the passphrase so that I can decrypt this. So full disk encryption actually always has that little bit at the front that's not encrypted uh, and can thus be modified. So. Um, the other part of the boot process to remember is that uh, before we can load the first part of the disk boot code, you've got an EEPROM in your PC system as well, and that's also unencrypted. And so together, the EEPROM and the unencrypted parts of your drive, that you know, they all are your boot code that help you boot. And yeah, if they're modified, uh, it's going to be trouble. And, Let's, uh, let's go over, okay, how do you attack full disk encryption? Um, we're going to go through just all the other ways that aren't relevant to today, but they're going to be in your heads and they're kind of fun to talk about. Okay, so there's the classic X KCD cartoon about just using co coercion, uh, rubber hose cryptanalysis uh, that works. And uh, there's, you know, you can have a physical thing logging someone entering the passphrase in. Uh, these are not that small compared to what we've learned uh, the NSA has developed uh, through the Snowden revelations. Um, you can also attack the passphrase uh, itself. You can do passphrase cracking. And uh, this is the famous correct horse battery staple cartoon. And, you know, hey, if you use four random words from the list of, you know, 11,000 words that are out there, well, then you get 44 bits of entropy. Turns out when you ask human beings to come up with for random words, the, we're much more likely to hit in our brains a much smaller word list, and 
uh, even if we're trying to not have any grammar to it, we may actually, and they even have password cracking techniques these days that, uh, that actually try to follow uh, sort of chains of grammar. Uh, so, okay, you can crack a pass, you can still try to crack a passphrase, even one that might actually be pretty good. I'm not going to explain what cold boot attacks are, but you should look them up. That's very, they're very interesting. Oh, and finally, this brings me to the, um, the way of attacking full disk encryption that I'm interested in. If you can taint the boot code, either the part that's on the hard drive unencrypted or the part that's in the firmware EEPROM, then you can have that do something nasty such as um, log, log the passphrase that someone puts in for their full disk encryption and then uh, can be recovered later. So uh, I think this is the coolest way to attack full disk encryption. But it doesn't, uh, you know, the world is trying to fight these kind of attacks. So there are, uh, there are okay, of course, countermeasures. Uh, here I'm alluding to uh, what became a standard in Windows 8 to get the Microsoft certified sticker. A uh, hardware manufacturer had to implement this, uh, which is the idea that your, um, your boot ROM uh, will check for a signature of, on the part that's on the hard drive. And so at least the hard drive, which is uh, easier to change, at least you have the ROM which is harder to change, uh, validating that. And um, they even actually also then, they try to actually shut down right access to the ROM shortly after this part of the, after early in the boot process. Basically, early on it checks for updates, after that, writes are, are locked out. Uh, now this doesn't protect you though from someone actually getting physical access to your machine and uh, using a programmer to rewrite your ROM chip, right? So really, this is uh, what people who are really serious about boot time security have been doing for a long time, uh, um, a super long time, but I'm, I know I think it's been at least 10 years or more. Uh, if you have on your bus a dedicated trip called a trusted platform module, this dedicated chip is able to uh, through the bus, read your RAM, and so it uh, it can have its own keys. You can have keys in the trusted platform module, uh, and they can cryptographically sign a message as to the contents of the RAM, and then write that back. And then, so then your program, uh, you can send that out to a to a remote system. The remote system can check the signature, and uh, you know the keys that the TPM is using to do signing. Are, uh, are not kept in RAM. Now, how many of you own a PC that has a TPM? You got some hands in the room. The thing is, they were um, they were really sort of marketed as a you know corporate business thing, and so uh, they didn't become super ubiquitous. Um, but here's what is going to become ubiquitous. Uh, particularly, it's, it is ubiquitous in the Intel world. The um, Intel is uh, putting a, um, a separate coprocessor in with their CPU packages uh, called the Management Engine. And they are putting a ton of functionality into it. Um, it's kind of, the scope creep on it is kind of is kind of outrageous. Like er early on, people just knew about it for like, oh, okay, well this coprocessor, it can do remote management for powering the machine on and off. But they're putting more and more things into it, um, including um, they're putting firmware verification in, they're putting DRM in, they're putting um, th their own implementation of a TPM so that you don't have to have a separate uh, chip added to the board. It all comes in the, uh, the CPU chip package. And uh, there's actually, um, from a security perspective, there's actually a you know, you're gaining some security features if you have one of these and you didn't have a TPM before, but uh, I, I'd suggest, uh, I, I don't want to get into it, but uh, follow this link and uh, you can learn some really interesting stuff. Uh, and here's a simpler uh, link along the same lines. So uh, what I'm going to get into is sort of a dumb and cheap alternative to uh, having the, these hardware-based solutions. So here's the idea. You've got the PC you want to boot and validate the firmware on. 
And the idea is you're not able to supervise it all the time. You're not able to provide physical security that you can fully rely on. Whereas you also have a second mobile device that maybe you trust a lot and you keep with you all the time or you keep it in a safe or something. So you hook the two together at boot time and the idea is the small portable device that you've been keeping care of that you trust, it's challenging, it's going to issue a challenge to the PC and say, okay, I'm going to get you to do some really hard work. And if the if anything malicious is going on in the boot process, I'm hoping that that malicious routine will actually cause the hard work to take a little bit longer. And I can look at not just sort of the the answer you return on the hard work, the, uh, so the output of the function, but I can also look at the timing to see, well, did, it, did you actually compute it on time? Uh, so here's me sort of stating that as a goal. Okay, wouldn't it be nice to develop a practical proof of work challenge algorithm with boot code and a challenge seed as inputs that will produce a recognizable performance different if the hardware is unaltered but malicious boot code is present? And before I go any further, if this sounds like a bad idea to you, it probably is a bad idea. If you're at all serious, use a TPM. But I think this is fun to explore. Okay, so here's the idea. In memory, we've got uh, the boot code, so the ROM and the, uh, uh, the first stages on the hard drive. Uh, and this includes actually our challenge program here. Um, and then the uh, secondary device that's issuing the challenge over some kind of cable, uh, it gives a seed uh, so that the challenge is unique every time that gets written to memory. And then the idea is we want to fill the rest of memory uh, with uh, some um, a hard to derive hard to derive data that's uh, derived from like the boot and seed. So a really big really big output of a hashing function basically. And by contrast, if there's also a malicious program present as well, and it, notably it can't overwrite the boot code because the boot code needs to be there, at least for read-only purposes, to be, uh, to be an input to this algorithmic challenge. So the malicious boot code actually has to take up a bit, uh, a bit of your memory. And uh, the, the vague idea here is that uh, if this challenge requires not only passing through the entire memory, but making additional passes that feed back into the algorithm, things that happened at the beginning, uh, the malicious boot code is going to have a hard time because uh, it's not going to have the RAM to work with to be able to, um, uh, to compute all the, uh, the outputs required. So, but there's a really bad assumption underlying all of this. We're assuming the attacker only is able to change the boot code to add in their malicious boot code. The uh, hardware has to be unaltered. Uh, and so in practice, that's ac verifying your hardware is unaltered is actually really hard. Uh, you would really want to, if you were going to do this, you would, you would not want to use this as a means to verify mobile devices that are a little compact and hard to take apart and stuff. You'd want it to be like a big desktop case that you're popping the top on and doing a really detailed inspection on because if there is any malicious hardware change, uh, it's going to uh, it's going to be bad news. It's going to it's going to wipe this out. So you you re um, and really it's got to be a server that is meant to be on all the time, and rarely rebooted. Uh, and it's also got to be a server where you can afford to have it boot go through a bit of an arduous boot process as well. So those are those are some major mistakes. So actually, when I say better be a desktop, I mean better be like a desktop style machine as a server, one that's really huge and you can pop the case on. The easiest attack on this hardware wise is to just have a tiny little transmitter that picks up what the challenge is, passes it off to a faster computer running wherever, uh, and then it doesn't ma the performance of our, uh, you know, it, uh, we're going to be able to match the performance uh, without actually doing any work on the, uh, the machine we're testing at all. So that would be bad. Also, um, you want to have your, the machine you're doing this on maxed out on the memory possible for that board because if you haven't maxed it out, an attacker can get around the fact that um, if your, your boot code thinks it's uh, got to work in, 
in two gigabytes, but you, an attacker has upgraded it to four, well then that, uh, the, their memory is no longer constrained. Uh, and speed is an issue here too. So really, you want to, to be doing this, you actually can't even use current hardware where something new is going to come onto the market for it anyway. You got to use something really old where your, uh, you, you have the fastest and largest RAM available for that board and uh, the cost for your attacker then becomes they have to actually fabricate uh, a hardware mod that it's, you know, if they're going to pop in a new chip, they got to actually fabricate a, a, a chip for something old as opposed to something commercial off the shelf. Same for a CPU. If an attacker can put in a faster CPU, uh, they can defeat this as well. So, um, again, you're going to want to have the fastest CPU that was ever available for a given socket, and you're only going to keep away attackers who can't fabricate a newer one, but at least you're, you're, you're going to have a defense against people who can buy, uh, you know, go to eBay to get what the fastest was. Um, and then, of course, overclocking comes into all of this as well. If you have to be pretty much, th this has to be like, you, your, your system's got to be running basically as fast as is safe, because an if an attacker overclocks and they can get away with it, they're going to have that extra, they're going to have the extra CPU time they need to, uh, uh, to get around this. Uh, and you could also attack this with, um, um, if you had something hidden on your target board that um, provided extra memory on the bus, like, okay, so you've maxed out what the board knows for RAM, but if you have uh, if you have something on the bus that provides extra RAM, and they, they used to do this with really old computers, like, okay, they were, um, they would have RAM cards that would go in, say, your ISA slot or your PCI slot, and programs would write, use that as extra memory. They would, they would, uh, they would page to it, but it, you know, it, it would be a lot faster than paging to a hard drive. So that kind of thing is going to screw you over. All right, so uh, the algorithm I tested for this is called Kachik. And um, the paper is really interesting. And uh, it's, a, it's a hashing algorithm, and they call it a particular class of hashing algorithm, they call it a sponge function. So the idea is that you, you squeeze data into it, and you can squeeze data out, and you can squeeze data in and squeeze data out, and it, it can just sort of keep going that way. Here's the fancy diagram version of sponge function. Okay, so I'm not going to actually explain the details of the Ketchik algorithm. I don't understand them myself, but the pictures from FIPS 202 uh, it's, Ketchik is notable for being adopted as the SHA-3 standard. Uh, so the, do, the uh, U.S. government document that makes that official is called FIPS-202. It's got some pretty diagrams. So Ketchik's kind of nice when you look at it from the pretty diagrams. Don't ask me to explain this. <laughs> All right, and then as a side note, uh, anytime you invent a, a new hashing algorithm, uh, you can always count that someone will make a cryptocurrency that uses that hashing algorithm. So just as a humorous aside, um, this is the only uh, slow in joke I will do, slide, slow transition. So there's sloth coin, and there's max coin, and this is the funniest, I think. Crypto meth. <laughs> okay, so other uh, applications of Kachuk. So I did some tests on this here laptop, and uh, uh, for every chunk of memory, I, uh, I tried with uh, Ketchik doing eight rounds, which is kind of close to the, um, the lower bounds uh, for what they sort of recommend. And then I tried out, uh, and I tried out with the, uh, um, the 24 rounds as standard in SHA-3. Notably, for this kind of application, you don't need to be as, um, the requirements on a hashing algorithm aren't quite as high insofar as we're not trying to prevent um, collision attacks. Uh, we just want to have an algorithm where at least there's no shortcuts. So uh, there's some room to tweak down the, the rounds there, but uh, more investigation needed. Okay, so, um, but yeah, uh, notably in the end, I, I actually had to use some fairly small memory sizes to do this. Um, the uh, and I did lots of passes and lots of trials, so you know this thing was working hard a few nights ago, and I, I think uh, maybe this at least as I tried it, it's not really fast enough. 
Um, but at least I got consistency on the second try. First time I ran this, I got uh, run times for full passes over 32 megabytes that were like two seconds to four seconds. And the, the whole, this whole thing rests on consistency. If, if the algorithm with the same length inputs but different inputs doesn't actually have the same performance time, then uh, you're not going to be able to distinguish a, uh, a legitimate inputs that have a different runtime from uh, legitimate inputs that have a different runtime because there's extra malware uh, using some of the resources and slowing it down. Okay, so this got all chopped up in my spreadsheet program. These are really just should be just flat bars, but uh, eventually I managed to get here um, uh, 0.03 plus or minus 0.03 milliseconds uh, for most of the passes fitting within uh, of, the, uh, of the mean of the, uh, of the runtime. And I think the reason I had, a, I was way off the first time was uh, my CPU was doing frequency scaling. So I got down on that after. So that's another complication illustrating why this is probably all a very bad idea. And then I started thinking about, well, wait a second. Uh, just because the malware is, say, there in the red square and it has a bit of working area in the blue squares, uh, does this mean that it's, uh, uh, when it, it does the second pass through, that it's going to have a hard time, uh, you know, it's, it's going to have to throw away some of, it's going to have to throw away some of the, the computation? And um, the answer is no. I, I'm not prepared to present this too well, so talk to me after if you want to understand why this is a, this is a major problem. Um, basically, it's a chain of computation, and you can go back to earlier points in the chain to recompute things that you didn't store uh, and uh, without much penalty. So I think this is a big problem. Um, maybe uh, if you have more than just, if you have, a, if you have the challenge machine, the little thing on the outside, uh, constantly providing more seed data. Maybe you can mitigate this, maybe not. I think that needs further research. Uh, it's looking sketchy. And the other way to attack this is uh, the, uh, you remember I said you had to keep a copy of the original boot code and you had to, you know, and you got the malicious one. Well, you could compress the original boot code and then sort of decompress it when it's needed. Uh, I think it could, uh, I think it requires a lot of then passes through overall. Uh, you got to pass through the memory over and over and over again so that it has to decompress over and over and over again and then that will uh, uh, it'll take a long I think it could take 250 passes to cause uh, a 0.04 milli 0.04 second delay to add up to like a second over uh, uh, over the course of lots of passes so uh, this is going to be problematic. So my conclusion is that I've not demonstrated this to be feasible, but hey, science, we tried. I'm going to take questions in the hallway track. Everyone have a good evening.